What do you do if you suddenly realize that the enemies are at your doorstep and you have no effective weapon to use against them? Well, you build the long nose door, apparently. Tank was saying that the Luftwaffe would soon need engines built for high-altitude performance as early as in 1941, but nobody listened. That's hardly surprising. At that time, the armies of the Third Reich still reigned supreme, but the change was already in the wind. The Focke-Wulf 190 was an excellent machine, but Allied pilots eventually learned how to deal with it. Furthermore, they started to fly new aircraft outfitted with powerful high-altitude engines. These new adversaries soon proved to be more than the Focke-Wulf 190 could chew. At 7,000 meters above the ground, the German engines were already in trouble, but for lightnings and thunderbolts, that was just the beginning. And that was not all. The British launched a massive bombing campaign against military objectives in German towns, and soon the British bombers were joined by the American B-17s. Those could go on bombing runs in broad daylight. Four turbo superchargers allowed them to operate at extremely high altitudes where the German planes were crippled. And the bombers of the Allies didn't come alone. They were protected by lightnings and thunderbolts, and the fearsome P-51D Mustang was already on its way. Finally aware of the gravity of the situation, the bosses of the Luftwaffe demanded that the engineers find a new way to counter the Allied aircraft as soon as possible. The German engine designers turned out to be more far-sighted than their superiors. They never stopped making designs for engines built for high-altitude performance and thus had quite a few things to show right off the bat. Of course, the best possible scenario would be to equip the Focke Wolf 190 with a large 18-cylinder radial aircraft engine. But the Americans were no fools and bombed the heck out of BMW factories. So an excellent BMW 802 was a no-go. There was only one other viable option – to use a 12-cylinder liquid-cooled engine. The Daimler-Benz DB603 was still being worked on, but then there was the promising Junkers Umo 213E that could already be used. It maintained the 35-liter displacement, but the German engineers added a pressurized cooling system and introduced a number of improvements that allowed it to run at a high RPMs. All of that required a special kind of fuel laced with tetraethyl and a water methanol injection system, later a nitrous oxide system. The engine also had to be given thorough maintenance after just a couple of flights, but that was well worth it. Throw in a two-stage supercharger and you get a great high-altitude engine. The only thing left to do was to actually build an aircraft that could use it. That's when the Focke Wolf 190 and its creator showed what they were both capable of. The almost modular design of the aircraft allowed the engineers to basically reinvent the plane in a matter of weeks. For instance, in order to fit the UMO 213 in the fuselage while maintaining balance, both the nose and the tail of the aircraft had to be lengthened. Quite a radical change, don't you think? Strangely enough, all of that worked, and at the start of 1943, the Germans had a final prototype of a new interceptor. Moreover, the aircraft was designed in such a way that it was possible to use the existing FW-190A or the FW-190F to build a new plane instead of building one from scratch. At first, the pilots were less than enthusiastic about the new fighter. A lot of them thought that the UMO 213 engine was better suited for a bomber. But soon, even the most skeptical ones were converted. The aircraft was climbing almost too fast. It could maneuver and dive as well as the early Focke Wolf 190, and most importantly, it was capable of downing any aircraft it faced, including the latest Allied types. The Allied bombers made sure that the Germans could never truly produce this plane in mass, and the Focke Wolf 190D were never made in great numbers. But despite all that, it didn't take a lot of time for the long nosed Dora to develop a fearsome reputation. But for Kurt Tank, this fighter was just a stopgap until a much more promising aircraft arrived. He was already working on the TA-152, but that's a story for another time. 